Hello and welcome. Our guest today is Leon Britton, former British Trade Minister and long-serving EU Trade Commissioner. Leon Britton's links to the World Trade Organization date to its very inception. Lord Britton was an instrumental negotiator in the Uruguay Round, the agreement which led to the creation of the World Trade Organization. His well-known negotiations with his U.S. counterpart, Mickey Cantor, paved the way for a broader agreement on the Uruguay Round among the 123 members of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the predecessor of the WTO. As the WTO marks its 15th anniversary, Lord Britain, now a special trade advisor to British Prime Minister David Cameron, is extremely well suited to reflect on the organization's past, to look at its present, and to perhaps project on its future. Lord Britain, welcome. Thank you. I'll ask you to think back a bit to 15 years ago in Marrakesh. Would you have imagined this organization to have evolved in the way that it has? Well, setting it up was uh, such a hassle, it involved such a lot of negotiation, that I don't think any of us really gave much thought to what it was going to be like in 15 years' time. We were pleased enough to get it started. But having said that, uh, I think its evolution has, broadly speaking, been on the lines that one would have wished, even if one didn't actually predict it at the time. In many ways, it's an organization that, that differs from the GATT. Um, how would you define those differences? And uh, have they been largely positive, or have they had their drawbacks? I think they have been overwhelmingly positive. I mean, the chief difference, of course, is that the GATT had no teeth, mm. uh, whereas uh, uh, here, uh, with the dispute settlement mechanism uh, and the consequences of not abiding by a finding, uh, being the withdrawal of trade benefits, um, there is real teeth to it, mm. uh, and that's absolutely crucial. Mm. In the 1990s, we had the Quad, and we had at the center of the Quad the negotiating relationship between the European Union, or the European Community in those days, and the United States. The situation today has evolved with many new actors, new players. What has been the consequence of this evolution, in your view? The consequence of this evolution has been very simply that it's harder to reach agreement. Mm. I mean, I thought even then, uh, of course, there were still uh, many fewer actors than there are now, but there were still quite a lot. And I thought it amazing that again and again and again I was told by the other actors and players in the world, you reach agreement with the United States and then we'll tell you what else we want. Uh, and that's exactly what happened, as you described with my discussions with Mickey Cantor. Um, I thought that was a sort of sleight of hand at the time to which uh, the non-US and EU uh, participants were party, were, were, were acquiescent, were, mm. were willing partners in that. I, it was clearly unsustainable. That as the organization grew, as the number of people grew, that was not going to be possible. Mm. So it's therefore, uh, the more you have, the, the, and uh, you, you operate on the basis of consensus, it's bound to be harder to reach agreement. And that's exactly what's happened. Do you think that the consensus principle itself should be revisited? I think sooner or later it will have to be, because to have a situation in which any one country can block uh, a, an advance which the overwhelming majority of the world trading community want to make is uh, difficult to defend. Uh, although its historical origin is clear and it's wonderfully democratic in a sense, I'm not sure that in uh, most democracies we would allow that. I think there was uh, only one country which had what was called the liberum veto, which was Poland, and that led to the breakup of the country. So <laughs> it's not a very happy precedent. So on the other hand, um, one can see we are talking about sovereign states, um, and it is difficult to, to advance from that. But I suspect we are going to see more plurilateral agreements, coalitions of the willing, if you want. Mm. Uh, and there's precedent for that already in what we did even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. With the ITA and... Indeed, uh, yes. One of the consequences of this trade body obtaining teeth, as you say, uh, has been that its profile has perhaps been, been raised. 
Uh, and that has had consequences as well. Uh, I recall at the end of the Uruguay round, there were one or two protesters in front of the building. And of course, within a very short space of time, uh, that all changed quite radically, didn't it? Yes. If you, I mean, it, the, the GATT was never just a debating society, but to put it in extreme terms, uh, if you're a body that hasn't got powers, but only sort of tries to bring people together, um, you are not going to arouse so much uh, disagreement as if it's if you're an organization that's powerful and got teeth. Mm. So that's an inevitable consequence in mm. today's world uh, of being a powerful and important organization. What could have been done differently, in your view, over the last 15 years that might have made the organization function better or be more effective? I don't think there's any fundamental change that I would have suggested would have made it work better. Uh, after all, uh, 15 years isn't all that long a time, mm. really, mm. Uh, and so it's doing what those of us who were involved in its creation wanted it to do. So it's not surprising that I'm not the person to say, well, it should all have been completely different because uh, uh, it's set up the way that I and a few colleagues um, had in mind. Mm. So I, I don't think uh, uh, I would... Uh, uh, now, looking forward, going on, is another story altogether. But I in its first 15 years, it has done what uh, we hoped it would do. Let me pick up on that a bit. How would you see this organization going forward in, say, the next 15 years? What will be... Um well, I think that um, uh, there are a number of things it's got to do, um, clearly, uh, with, I, I think that, uh, in principle, the rules on free trade agreements are, are quite strict. I don't believe they are being observed, and I don't think that the WTO has been tremendously effective in policing them. I can't think of a case in which the WTO has said, this agreement is... Uh, contrary to the international trade rules. Mm. Uh, it's difficult to believe that quite a lot of them aren't. Mm. Uh, and uh, individual countries have not made complaints about WTO, uh, about uh, FTAs and things like that. So I think that's one area in which uh, the organization needs to think about what it's going to do. Another is on regional uh, agreements uh, to try and bring some sort of order um, even when they are lawful, uh, th their existence in their present form has greatly complicated things and some kind of, I won't say codification, but, 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 but agreement as to what they should and shouldn't contain could be useful. Uh, and then, of course, as I've said already, uh, I think the organization has to address uh, the question of um, plurilateral agreements and to what extent do you wish to accommodate those, or is that to be regarded as a sin against the Holy Ghost, which there's been one breach of, but uh, never again? Those are the kind of things that I think that the organization has to think about. Do you see uh, these FTAs or bilateral agreements as being in some way a threat to the multilateral system? Well, they could, not, not, the answer is not so far. But if they went, if they proliferated excessively and were contrary to the rules uh, that have already been established and nobody did anything about it, they could be. The Doha round has now gone on even longer than the Uruguay round. Um, if you could compare the two, how, how would you do that? How would you put the Doha round next to the Uruguay round in terms of its... Uh, intensity, complexity, and, and other factors such as this? Well, the thing that uh, strikes uh, me most is that um, the business community, uh, and I'm talking about the United States and Europe, essentially, is less hungry for the Doha round than it was. Um, it was possible for those of us who wanted to get the Uruguay round completed to enlist uh, the business community. Now, today, they are still pass resolutions saying it's very important and so on and so forth, but they sometimes feel like kind of addenda to their main business. They're not hollering. They're not uh, going to the doors of government and saying, look, you know, for God's sake, you've just got to fix this. 
Uh, that's one of the things that's different. Now, it may be that that is because, in terms of the developing, developed world, um, so much was achieved by the Uruguay Iran that the uh, additional gains for them of the Doha Round are less pressing. I happen to think they're still beneficial, uh, and I think that even if it's not a case of actual uh, further market access, something which enables the developed world, developing world to emerge and play a larger part in the trading community is in the interest of the developed world as well. Mm. But that's less urgent than saying, look, if you uh, uh, reach agreement, we are going to get access to this market, that market, because there are huge tariffs there and they're going to come down. That kind of prize is less, it's not not evident, but it's less prominent than it was in the case of the Uruguay Round. You did your job perhaps a bit too well, maybe, back in those days. Well, I hope that people have benefited from it. But you, you touched on an interesting point. If you look at where the growth is today and where it's likely to come, in the certainly in the near future, it's in these large emerging developing countries, which are difficult to negotiate with bilaterally, at least if you're the U.S. or the EU, uh, and which um, have in place a certain number of barriers which exceed those of the developed countries for, for some very obvious reasons. Uh, do you think that this is an opportunity, the Doha round, to open these markets for it, the... It certainly is, <coughs> but uh, to make the argument, which I think many economists would make, that is actually in the interests of those countries to open up their markets even unilaterally, mm is something which uh, uh, is difficult because, we, 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 uh, in a way, uh, uh, the process of negotiation which we have established militates against that kind of view because the, the, everybody is so inured to the concept that you, it's this for that, you give up this and you gain that, uh, 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 and therefore um, the developing world, even if it would be in its interest unilaterally to open up more than it has done, won't do that. It says, right, and what are we going to get in return for that? Um, now, I'm not saying they shouldn't get something in return for that, but um, that's the difficulty that we have. You, you mentioned the idea that even unilaterally opening, if you listen to economists, is in your own best interests. And yet, in this House, and in almost all of our negotiations, these are viewed as concessions. Yes, uh, they are. Do, do you think this sort of approach has made it more difficult to uh, have a trade uh, agreement? Uh, well, it has certainly made it more difficult, but I think it's pretty inevitable. I mean, mm -hmm. let's be realistic about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the economic argument in favor of unilateral uh, disarmament, if you want to call it that, uh, is a valid one, but uh, people are so used to the idea of I've got this and I'm not doing moving until I give uh, that, 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 that that's where we are. Mm. Having said that, actually, as the WTO knows better than anyone else, there has been quite a, a considerable amount uh, of uh, voluntary reduction and elimination of trade barriers, uh, 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 not as part of a negotiation. Quite a lot of countries have done that. And indeed, one comes across it in the negotiations. Uh, even when I was doing it last, people said, uh, you know, you've got to take into account the fact that we have already removed bar barriers, not in the negotiation, but just as part of our developing process. Mm. There's a lot of that going mm. on. What needs to be done to conclude the Doha round? Well, I think the United States has to engage uh, more seriously than it has done now. It has to show that it's really interested and wants this to happen. And I understand that there are political uh, pressures in the United States which make that difficult, and if not difficult, not a priority. Uh, and some of the developing countries have to be ready uh, to open up uh, uh, in a way that is commensurate with the path and pace of their development. Has the Great Recession, as it's been called, made negotiating this round more difficult? Well, I not entirely, I don't entirely buy that because my, the, what people forget is at the time of the conclusion of the Uruguay round, there was a mini recession. It wasn't as great as this one, but nonetheless, it felt at the time like a recession. 
uh, we didn't know that there was going to be 10 years later a worse one. Uh, and the strange thing was that it, it didn't stop an agreement. And it didn't stop an agreement because people were ultimately persuaded that uh, at a time of recession, the concept of spending your way out of it wasn't quite as prevalent then as it is this time round. And people felt that one of the few things that you could do was to open up markets. They were persuaded of the fact that trade was uh, an engine of growth. Uh, and therefore, although I was told, oh, well, you haven't a chance of finishing this during a recession, wait until the recession's over, that's not what happened. So um, my innate uh, optimism makes me feel uh, that the recession, at any rate, we're, we're, we're sort of out of it. Uh, growth is very low, but we are out of the worst of the recession, should not and will not in itself prevent a conclusion to the Doha round. Lord Britain, many thanks for joining us, and many thanks to you for watching.